Good morning, everyone. As we begin to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, I'd like to make some applications from one of our recent studies. A few months ago, we engaged in a very robust study of the Ten Commandments. And as you'll remember, the third commandment in Exodus 20 states the following, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. We had an in-depth review of what that commandment meant and looked at the deeper meaning of how we could take the Lord's name in vain. We discussed the vulgarity of the world as they improperly use God's name these days and the flippant phrases that people use these days and the falsehoods and false promises that people speak using God's name. All of these certainly fit the intent of this command. One additional item caught my attention as I was looking through various lexicons about how they describe the use of this word. And in one of them, it said this, the evidence points to the fact that taking the Lord's name, that is his reputation in vain, will surely cover profanity, as that term is understood today, or swearing falsely in the Lord's name. But it will also include using the Lord's name lightly, unthinkingly, or by rote. Perhaps this is captured by the Septuagint translation as thoughtlessly. As I read that phrase by rote or thoughtlessly, that really concerned me a lot because you can think of someone in the Old Testament law that was possibly engaged in an act of worship or participating in the sacrificial rites. And he invoked God's name just as a matter of routine without any special significance to his name at that moment, and without recognizing the glory of God in that moment from the heart. And whenever we invoke the name of God, and whether we use the phrase the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, or God, we must always remember that he is worthy of all praise and all worship and glory in the moment that we use his name. Remember the throne scenes that we've been studying from the book of Revelations recently, and you'll get the concept of just how much glory and honor God's name is due. And with that as backdrop, let's now look at how we're told to partake of the Lord's Supper. And we're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23, to get the full context. And there Paul, through the Spirit, writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup, of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So it's that last phrase that we want to focus on this morning, not discerning the Lord's body. It complements the phrase that we just read from the Old Testament, in vain. We could do the same thing in partake of the Lord's Supper if we're not discerning the Lord's body. So what is that meaning of the word discern and how does that apply to us? So again, looking at some of the lexicons, one of them says to separate, to make a distinction. Another says discriminating what the supper represents. And one other says to distinguish, to make a distinction and to cause to differ. So in this supper, we are to separate or distinguish the Lord's body as we partake. It is special. It's not a common meal. And this cannot be a rote act, one done by habit. And it can't be something that we just take a piece of bread and drink from the cup uh, during the supper. Our minds have to be actively engaged to properly discern Jesus' body and what it means to us. So what should we discern about Jesus' body as we partake? Well, there's many things we can mention, but we'll focus on three this morning. First, we must always remember that Jesus, whom we're remembering today, was deity, the Son of God. We can never think of him as just a man. And I would say that many today in the religious world tend to get a little too familiar and casual with the name of Jesus, thinking of him as a good man or a friend to others on the earth. We remember that he was God incarnate on this earth. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. And in Colossians chapter 2, Paul writes, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
So sh we should never invoke the name of Jesus thoughtlessly or partake of this memorial by rote or by habit when it comes to remembering Jesus. If we do, we are not properly discerning his body as the Son of God. Secondly, we need to remember that God willingly gave his Son for us and wants all men to be saved. He made provision for our salvation through his Son. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 2, God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And in John 3, 16, the verse that we know so well, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And in conjunction with God's love for us, Jesus willingly gave his life for us, that God's will might be fulfilled and that we could have the hope of eternal life. He says in John chapter 10, Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes, And walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. We can never forget that Jesus' life was offered willingly, both by the Father and by the Son. It was the manifest expression of God's love for us. And finally, we must always remember that it's only through Jesus' death that we can be saved from our sins. It's only by his blood and sacrifice that we are redeemed and made whole with God. We're hopeless without him. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And Peter says in Acts chapter 4, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We must always remember that it's only in Jesus' death that we have the hope of salvation. There is no other way for us to be reconciled with God. So this morning, this memorial supper reminds us of Jesus' death, what he did for us, and what his death and sacrifice means to our lives. We should never take of this memorial, and take it for granted, or partake thoughtlessly or by rote, and combining phrases that we've talked about this morning, we shouldn't take this supper in vain. So today, let's focus intently on the supper and these meanings. Let's always hold Jesus in appropriate reverence, allowing ourselves to be completely humbled by the love and grace that has been bestowed upon us, his children, and remembering that it's only through Jesus' death that we're at peace with God. Let's now properly discern the body of Jesus as we partake of the supper.